Hey, welcome. Employment Law Show. That's what the show is called. John Scholes here along again with uh, Lior Samfiru from the firm. Want to fill you full of employment law knowledge on the show today, Lior. What you need to know about workplace harassment. This is a hot topic. Has been for well over, well, since the pandemic, really. This is uh, this has come to the fore for sure. That and terminations. But uh, we'll get to all that in just a little bit. I'll give you the the, re the uh, contact information anyway to reach out to Lior at any time. 1-855-821-5900. That is the number. The phone number. Uh, the website terminationquestions.com. You can go there as well. Pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, Lior, is a website you put together a while ago. And within that is the severance pay calculator, which I'm sure will come up on the show a little later on. And then finally, the email address, help at employmentlawyer.ca. That's all coming up. We'll refer to it all. You can use it any time during the show or otherwise. But first, uh, let's get to a week that was. What's going on with you, pal? There are a lot of calls this week for me, a lot of emails, more than ever, people that watched this show or heard us on radio, and what they heard triggered something, some, raised questions for them, or made them realize that, wait a second, I have more rights than I realized. There is something that I can do about my workplace issue. And yeah, you're absolutely right, there is. You might not necessarily know it right now, but laws in this, in, in this country, in every province, are actually quite good, they're extensive. They're very comprehensive when it comes to your employment law rights. But again, you're, the laws can help you if you don't let it, if you decide to walk away from your entitlement. So this show is about giving you that knowledge, that information about your employment law rights so that you don't make mistakes, so you don't walk away from your rights, so that you know how to deal with the inevitable workplace issues that may arise. They do arise, many people, Thousands and, and frankly, millions of people across the country have been impacted with COVID-19. Their job has been impacted. So if you're one of them, believe me, there is something you can do. Employment laws are still here. And on this show and on every show, we'll talk about those things. And if you want to actually take that next step and do something about that workplace problem that you're facing, call me at the office or email me. That information, John already gave it and will continue to give it throughout the show today so that you can reach out without any, any hesitation. But to our uh, issue today, week that was, let me tell you about a situation that came across my desk very recently. I spoke with a lady who recently had signed a one-year contract to, to replace an employee that went on maternity leave. Signed a one-year contract. Two months into this contract, her employer calls her into a meeting and says, we are letting you go. It's just not working out, uh, you know, nothing personal. And because you're not your probationary period, we don't have to pay you anything, but we're going to be nice and we're going to offer you two weeks pay. Again, you're in your probationary period. And frankly, this seemed to her like it made sense. It's two months in, must be in my probationary period. They're offering two weeks pay. I should just accept it. Well, fortunately, someone encouraged her to call me. So why do I say fortunately? Number one, she actually wasn't on probation. And the reason she wasn't on probation is she never signed an employment agreement putting her on probation. When she started there, the agreement she signed said nothing about probation. It said nothing that the first three months are probationary period and, and that she could be let go during that period of time. And because of that, she's not on probation. Remember, probation is not automatic. Probation only happens if you sign an agreement that puts you on probation. So you start another job, you're not on probation unless the agreement you signed says so. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because she signed a fixed term contract for a year. And the rule is, if you are let go before the end of the contract, you still have to get paid the balance of the contract. Right. She signed a one-year contract. She was let go two months into it. There's still 10 months left on that contract. So not only is she owed severance, she's owed 10 months severance. She's owed the balance of the contract. So what she thought was a good offer, two weeks pay, is a horrendous offer because she's owed 10 months pay. So the two lessons, number one, you're not on probation unless you sign a document that says you're on probation. And of course, number two, maybe even more important is if you sign a fixed term contract, for six months, 12 months, three years, whatever it is, if the company lets you go before the end of it, the basic rule, the general rule is they still have to pay you for the time you could have or should have worked. The difference, and that could mean months and months pay. Please remember that if you're ever in that situation. 
You know, when it comes to probation periods, even if you sign a probation on your on your contract, what if it's six months? I mean, you know, you get three months in or six months. Do they have to? Is it only for a certain amount of time they can get away with it without paying severance? Meaning that if you're on six months probation rather than three, they might still owe you something if they let you go. Right. So the only the only period of time during which an employer can get away with not paying severance is right. three months. All right. Okay. So they cannot get away with that for three months in a day or four months or six months, no other period of time. So it's three months. So as a practical matter, you really can only be a, a, on proper probation for three months. But remember, even in the first three months, you're not on probation. You are still owed your full severance unless you sign an, a document, an agreement that says otherwise. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, you're owed severance even after one month, two months, three months. You're absolutely owed severance. The website, employmentlawyer.ca, that's the place to go to find our radio show. We've been doing it for years. We pull the phone calls from it that we get in that live show. We play them back here. Phone call number one, Lior, is coming at you right now. I'm in a sales department where we've just recently restructured. You get salary plus bonus. We have to make a certain amount of, like a goal, basically. And I've been a uh, top performer for the last 10 years. I'm fearful that I may not be able to keep up with making my goals because of this restructure. If they do let me go because I'm not able to meeting my goals, would they be able to let me go? And if so, would I receive severance? Hmm. So remember, your employer can let you go even if you've done nothing wrong, but severance has to be paid. So her employer can say, you know what, we're letting you go. We, we are not happy with something, so we're letting you go. But severance would have to be paid. They don't even have to give a reason. Severance has to be paid. What she's really asking is, if I'm not going to meet my goals, can they let me go for cause? Can they let me go without severance? Well, no. For that, the company would have to show more, much more than she didn't meet her goals. They'd have to almost show that she was doing it on purpose. She could have worked and, and met her goals. She chose not to. She was slacking off. She was sitting uh, and, and Googling uh, travel destinations uh, instead of working when she was supposed to be working. That's the type of conduct that maybe, maybe at some point could be cause for termination. If you're working but you still can't meet your targets, can't meet your goals, that is not something that the company can fire you over for cause as long as you're doing what you're able to do. So we know she's going to be owed severance. Of course, the next logical question is how much severance? So let's take her information as we like to do on this show and let's plug it into the severance calculator, which is available, of course, on pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. So we see right there, uh, we look at, again, we're looking at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. She's been there for 10 years in a sales role. Her employer may say cause. If they do, that's a wrongful dismissal because, as you can see at the bottom, she could be owed as much as 12 months severance, 12 months pay. The big, big factors, of course, are her age, her position, and the length of her employment. So even if she doesn't meet targets, 12 months severance potentially is what she's owed. So remember, if you're not meeting your targets, that does not mean you will lose your severance. Far from it. The obvious question some people will have, though, she was in a sales role for 10 years. Now, she had base plus commission, but if it's simply a commission structure, I mean, it can be like this, right? So how do you base that severance number? Yeah, a lot of people have compensation that varies from year to year, mm -hmm. uh, even month to month. Some months are good, yep. some months are bad. Year's good, year's bad. So when it comes to your severance, we simply look at an average. If you've only been there for a year, we'll look at the year average. If you've been there for many years, we'll usually look at a two or three year average and we'll see what you make on average. And let's say on average, you make $68,000. Well, that's going to be the figure we're going to use to calculate your severance. So it's absolutely fine to, to uh, have compensation that fluctuates. We'll look at an average, and that's going to be the number we're going to use to make sure you get your full severance. Going to give you another way to reach out anytime to Lior and the crew, terminationquestions.com. That's the place you go, terminationquestions.com. Lior, I want to read one to you now from Shaniza. Writes in today, says, a few months after the start of the pandemic, nearly all my co-workers were recalled from a layoff a year later, and I'm still waiting to be called back. When I asked why, my boss said that he was prioritizing younger employees first for safety and efficiency reasons. Well, while I'm 58 and one of the oldest on the team, I'm very good at my job. What should I do? Wow. Yeah, well, wow is absolutely correct. So, so let's even start, let's put the age thing 
to the side, and I'll come back to it in just a second here. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that she's been on a layoff, that in and of itself is not legal, regardless of why, regardless of who they call back and why, the layoff itself is a termination. She could have treated months ago, potentially, that layoff as a termination and said, enough is enough. By putting me on this layoff, because of COVID-19, you've terminated my employment, and now, guess what, employer? You have to pay me my full severance. By the way, that could be as much as two years' pay. So right off the bat, what the company did would not be legal. But then they made it worse. They didn't call her back because of her age. Well, you know, you, we have a name for that. That's age discrimination. It's as simple as that. It's a human rights violation. Your employer cannot make decisions about your work status, about anything to do with your job based on your age. Doesn't matter if they have good intentions. Maybe this employer thought that they're protecting her uh, by uh, not calling her back to work given COVID. Well, that's not the employer's call to make. Your age should not be a factor at all in any decision your employer makes. And if they do, again, that's a human rights violation. So not only in this situation do we have a, a, a termination, the fact that she was put on the, on the layoff when that was illegal, that's also a discrimination here. She wasn't called back to work because of her age. This employee did it wrong. She has significant entitlements, and I'd want to connect, her to her, connect with her so that I can help her get what she's owed. Well, Shanice, you know TerminationQuestions.com, but I'll give you the phone number as we get into a break. You can reach out 1-855-821-5900. And after we come back, we'll talk about workplace harassment, what you need to know. That is on the way in the Employment Law Show. Stick around. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false, and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just gonna walk away. Your insurer may ignore you. They may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks' pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Welcome back. Employment Law Show reaching out. I'll give you that uh, right away. 1-855-821-5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca. But, Leo, we want to talk about another very important topic that has been coming up a lot lately, and that is the topic of workplace harassment, right? Yeah, workplace harassment is, is a huge issue. And, you know, when I started practicing all these years ago, you didn't hear a lot about it. It wasn't something that was discussed openly. A lot, and it's not because there wasn't harassment going on. It's because I think employees were uncomfortable bringing it up. They were not uncomfortable understanding what their rights are. Well, because of some high-profile high cases over the past number of years, people are starting to understand, well, wait a second. I shouldn't be the victim of harassment. I have rights. I have entitlements, including the right to a safe and supportive and healthy work environment. So workplace harassment, that stigma around it is gone. If you're being harassed or mistreated, there is there are things you have to do about it and you can do about it. So we're going to be talking in the next few minutes, over the next few minutes, about what your rights are and what to do if you are mistreated. Well, let's clear up exactly what it is. What kind of conduct, uh, conduct rather, is considered harassment? So workplace harassment is a very broad term, and it encompasses any type of behavior that would be considered unwelcome. So if you're subject to any behavior that's, that's unwelcome, uh, name calling, uh, putting down, uh, being ignored, uh, certainly anything that's, that's overly aggressive, any of that can and is considered workplace harassment. So anything that if an outsider were to look at inside and see what's happening, that outsider would say, that is not right. Well, that's considered workplace harassment. That's considered something that's inappropriate. And, and the principle is, as I've said before, very simple. We have a right to a safe, healthy, supportive work environment. And anything that deviates from that, anything that takes the work environment and makes it different than that is considered under the rubric of workplace harassment. Does the employer have to prevent or at least go to great lengths to prevent workplace harassment, even if it's outside of the office setting? 
So not only is it good business, uh, a good business reason uh, for an employer not, not to allow workplace harassment and prevent workplace harassment, they have a legal obligation to uh, prevent and protect workplace harassment. So an employer has to investigate and ultimately take measures to rectify the situation, to ensure that there, there is no harassment in the workplace. Very, very, very important. An obligation that an employer cannot ignore. Gone are the days when an employer can say, you know what, you guys figure it out, or oh, come on, he's just kidding. That doesn't work anymore, that's illegal, and that can get an employer in a lot of trouble. And to your point, John, sometimes the protecting employees from workplace harassment could extend beyond the workplace. If there are employees that are mis being mistreated outside of work by coworkers, once the employer becomes aware of that, the employer has to deal with that. Workplace harassment that happens outside of the work, but that can ultimately bleed into the workplace, is still something the employer must deal with, cannot ignore. So that is a very extensive obligation that an employer has to take seriously. And it is up to the employer to, once they become aware, to do what it has to to fix the problem and eradicate it. Now, if you put your employee hat on for a moment, what should you do if you think you're a victim of harassment in the workplace? Well, the first thing you have to do is make sure you speak to someone in a position of authority, mm -hmm. HR, your supervisor, the owner, whoever the appropriate person is in your workplace. If your workplace is complying with the law, they already should have policies dealing with workplace harassment. And one of the things those policies will say is, who do you talk to if you are being mistreated? Who do you go to? Who's your first line of defense? So that is something you want to do. You don't want to allow your employer to say, hey, we didn't know. We, we had no idea that that was going on. You have to tell them, and by the, by the way, you have to do it in writing. Tell your employer in writing what's happening. Tell your employer in writing who's mistreating you and what you want to see happen here. By doing that, now the onus, the obligation shifts to the employer to do something about it, to investigate, to take measures, to do whatever it needs to do to make sure that that situation is resolved. So you shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. You shouldn't be afraid to deal with it. You cannot be punished, by the way. You cannot be penalized in any way, shape, or form for raising workplace harassment issues. That in itself is illegal. You have this, I call it the dome of protection around you if you're being harassed and, and wanna do something about it. And by the way, even if it turns out that you couldn't prove your harassment, despite that, your employer can never ever penalize you for raising it as an issue. What if it's a, a small workplace, you know, mom and pop shop, or maybe the person you're supposed to re report to is the one doing the harassment? What do you do then? Well, yeah, sometimes there isn't someone to talk to. You Maybe just you and your boss, that's the workplace. The boss is harassing you, who do you talk to? Well, if you cannot deal with it internally, which is to talk to someone, we deal with it externally. That's when you call me and I can deal with it. I can get you out of there so that you don't have to face that problem. Uh, in some situations, I may be able to uh, explain very nicely or not so nicely if I have to, uh, to your employer what its obligations are so we can deal with it externally. If you can't deal with it externally, call me and let me deal with it for you. That would be the right way to do it if there's no one to talk to inside the company. Now, as an employer, I receive a word of harassment from an employee. How do I react to it? What do I do? Well, first thing you have to do is take it seriously. Okay. So it starts with taking it seriously, making sure you understand that it's not a minor thing. Even if you don't necessarily know if it's true, or maybe you don't even believe the person, doesn't matter. You have to take it seriously and then conduct an investigation. Depending on the situation, you may decide to investigate or have someone internally within the company investigate. If it's a more complicated situation, if there's more, a lot of people involved, it may be prudent to bring an outside investigator in to determine what actually happened and, and give you some recommendations. But you, you investigate, you take it seriously, you investigate. And then if there are findings that something inappropriate happened there, you have to make take measures to fix that issue. That may mean penalizing the guilty party. That may mean letting someone go, maybe. That may mean Im Im implementing better policies or providing training about proper workplace conduct. There's a number of things an employer can do. What it cannot do is ignore the problem. Now, finally, if, if, if I'm an employee and I, I've brought about a, a claim of harassment to my, to my supervisor, my superiors, they brush it off, don't do anything about it, or even worse, they penalize you for bringing about the harassment claim. What do you do? 
Well, first thing, make sure that you've raised the issue in writing. Make sure that there's a written record of the fact that you try to resolve it, that you addressed your employer about it. Email works beautifully. Send an email saying, here's what happened, employer, please deal with it. And if your employer won't deal with it, follow up email. Say, employer, I've asked you already to deal with this. Please do something about this so that I'm, not, I'm no longer being harassed or, and, or mistreated in the workplace. And if that still doesn't work and your employer won't get off its hands and do something, that's when you reach out to me. That's when it's time to say, enough is enough. That harassment in and of itself can be a constructive dismissal. By putting you in that situation, by mistreating you, by making it difficult for you to go to work every day, you may be able to treat that as a termination and say, enough, I'm out of here. That could be a human rights violation, potentially, as well. So if you've tried to resolve it and you can't, let me resolve it, because guess what? They will not ignore me. Okay, before we break, I want to get to one more phone call from our radio show, Lior, so we'll do that right now. I left the company about three months ago. I was working for them for just under a year. Uh, I was a process server and was working 60 hours plus a week, and I never got paid any time and a half. Am I eligible for that? But I was working like, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, and I never got paid time and a half ever. Well, obviously, depending on his province, you know, overtime could be, uh, whether it's 40 or, you know, hours, that's in BC, 44 hours a week in Ontario. So, yeah, he's going to be out overtime, and he could potentially go back two years to pursue that overtime, two years from now to get it. Now, but there's another thing as well. If you're working and your employer won't pay you overtime, won't pay you what they owe you, that failure to pay in and of itself could be a constructive dismissal. So if you leave because your employer won't pay you as they're obligated to pay you, the law would consider that to be a termination. You didn't leave because you didn't want to work there. You left because the company was doing something illegal. In that situation, not only can you get your overtime, yes, of course you can get your overtime, you can get severance as well. So remember, salary, hourly, your employer has to pay you overtime if you work more than the threshold that applies in the province that you work in. If you're not sure what that is, if you're not sure if they should be paying, if they're paying it right, if they are not paying at all, reach out to me. Let's have that discussion and let me help you get that fixed. Okay, let's take a short break. When you come back, we'll talk about signing a new contract with less pay. I don't know about that one. 1-855-821-5900, the number, and employmentlawyer.ca is the website. Stick around. Coming right back. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just going to walk away. Your insurer may ignore you, they may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. And yeah, welcome back. Uh, the website again, employmentlawyer.ca, if you want to find a radio show near you. And we'll get to call number three from that radio show now, Lior. Out of the blue, I was approached uh, by my employer that I'd worked with for the last uh, four and a half years with totally change of our, our contract terms. He expected me to sign right away and reducing my pay rate, the way it was structured, it was going to be substantially less if I do the same numbers that I did prior. What are my rights? Can he come out of the blues and just do something like that? My average income would have been 75 in that range. I'm uh, 63. Well, John, this goes back to the rule, and you're shaking your head, you should be, uh, and the rule being, of course, that your employer cannot make significant changes to terms of employment, and such a pay cut is a significant change. There's no person that would look at that and say, that's not a big deal, that's not significant. Of course, it is significant. So his employer hasn't doesn't have that right to do that, no more than he would have the right, the employee, to say, I want a huge pay increase, so starting tomorrow, you're paying me 30% more. It's not possible. <laughs> The employer can't reduce his pay that way as well. Now, his employer wants, wants 
to, to have a new agreement signed. Well, why on earth would he ever sign a new agreement that takes away rights, that gives the company the right to limit or, or to reduce his pay? So no, he should not sign that agreement. He should say thanks, but no thanks. At that point, the employer is going to have a few options. Either the employer backs off and say, okay, we'll keep you as you are, fine, we continue working, best case scenario. Or the employer may say, well, too bad, we're doing it anyway. Or the employer may say, we're just letting you go for not agreeing. If either of those two things happen, if the employer says, too bad, we're reducing your pay anyway, or lets the person go, in either of those situations, he is owed severance. If his pay is reduced unilaterally, that's a constructive dismissal. Obviously, if he's let go, that's just a regular dismissal. In both situations, he is owed severance because he does not have to accept a pay cut. He does not have to sign a contract that is a bad contract for him, that reduces his pay, that changes the terms of his employment. So the last question, of course, is, okay, you've convinced us, Lior, he's owed severance. How much severance? Well, let's take that information, let's plug it as we do into pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. So we see on the screen, 63 years old. We know he's been there for four years. Uh, depending on, on his specific job, let's say he's a professional, he could be owed as much as 10 months of severance, 10 months, even after only four years of employment, okay? Anywhere from eight to 10, uh, depending on all those factors. So that, that applies if he's let go, but it also applies if he is not let go, but he chooses to leave because of that pay cut. Your employer does not have a right to make significant changes. If they do, it gives you the right to treat that as a constructive dismissal. All right, we've got time to refer one more time to terminationquestions.com. Lior, this time around, it's going to be Jake. Jake says, I use the pocket employment lawyer. Good man. And it said that I am owed eight months of severance pay by my former employer. Why does the government's website say I am owed far less? John, we only have like two minutes before the show ends, and I'm afraid I'm going to get up on my pedestal and want to talk for 20 minutes. Uh, you know, this is a subject that I feel very strongly about, and I've spoken a lot about this. I've, I've written a lot about this. So let's be very clear. The government, regardless of what province you're in, can only advise and does only advise with respect to minimum entitlements. So if you go to the Ministry of Labor or the Employment Standards website in whatever province you're in, Ontario, Alberta, BC, doesn't matter. And you look on, on the section dealing with termination, you'll see that it talks about, oh, you get a week per year of service. So you work two years, it's uh, two weeks, three years, three weeks, etc. And you think, well, that's all I'm owed. Except that's not all you're owed. That is only a small portion of what you're owed. The government only advises with respect to your minimum entitlements, not your full entitlements. That's why that information is on the website, because for in, in its infinite wisdom, all provincial governments have decided we shouldn't tell people about their full entitlements. Well, your full entitlements, what we call your common law entitlements, are significantly greater. It's what the courts have decided that someone in your situation should be getting. So yes, your minimum entitlements, as outlined by the Ministry of Labor uh, on their website, could be three weeks pay. Your full entitlements or your common law entitlements could be six months pay, eight months pay, even 12 months pay. That's why it's so, so important. If you lost your job, senior employee, junior employee, short service, long service, let's get advice. Call me or even easier. Grab your smartphone, tablet, desktop, whatever you want. Go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Calculate yourself in seconds how much you're owed. The real amount, the full amount. Not your small minimum entitlements, your actual full legal entitlements. One of the main reasons why we started the radio show almost 10 years ago, pal, right there is the Ministry of Labor and this uh, misinformation that's flooded everybody's mind. But we'll leave it there for another week. You want to reach out to Lior and his uh, crew now? Here's how you do that as we uh, wrap it up for another week. 1-855-821-5900. The phone number, help at employmentlawyer.ca. If you just shorten that to employmentlawyer.ca, that is where you'll find the radio show near you. You can catch that every week for an hour-long taste of what we do here on TV. And then finally, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, that website is worth its weight in gold, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. So enjoy that and use it as you will, free and anonymous. We'll catch you next time in the Employment Law Show.